So I'm going to talk about some recent work I'm doing with uh, loads of people uh, here present. I'm a postdoc in the lab of Alain Destex, um, and this is more or less what I've been doing. So let me introduce uh, a little bit the topic, which was more or less introduced in the last session. So it's I'm really interested in this idea of consciousness. And I, I really like this quote of the Stan Dehan uh, book. Uh, For many years, no serious researcher will touch the problem. Speculating about consciousness was a tolerated hobby for the agent scientists. And if you look at the history and you see that the people that were speculating, speculating about consciousness were these people having already a, um, a Nobel Prize. But now it's not anymore the case because we have the technology not just to speculate, but to do science, to start to address the question from a different perspective. And more or less, again, I think it... It's a nice continuation of the of the discussion of the panel discussion. So why does consciousness? Why why it's important? It's important because there are lots of people in in the state of coma now that we don't know what's really going on for different so different different accidents can lead you to to this condition. And we live in a society that is aging more. So the problems of dementia in general, we know very little how. We can help these patients. The whole idea of well-being in general is related to the states of consciousness. And again, we know very little. This talk is mainly about general anesthesia that has become my 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 main topic of research during the last year. Is fascinating what anesthesia do to the brains and in general the impact that this drug have had in society. It's immeasurable. Of course, catatonia and all the different uh, experience that can mark the history on the, of the on first uh, uh, person experience, all the different problems related to sleep and how it affects our, our, our lives, and a topic that is really uh, uh, present in the last years, it's the psychedelics and the promise of theory, therapeutic uh, applications of, of these drugs. So in, in general, consciousness has been studied in the past, but from different perspectives that has little to do with science. And probably the first one that started to to this, this research and, and link with the brain was uh, René Descartes, with this French mathematician and philosopher of the 17th centuries. We, that completely missed the target because he thought that the, the, the consciousness was sit here in the pineal gland. But it's important, I think, to mention that even in the 17th century already, the people started to look at the relationship between the consciousness and the, and the brain. So of course, we don't really know where to look at consciousness on the brain because we don't really know if it's in the molecular level at the cellular circuit. You are here, the ultras of, of prefrontal cortex. So probably many of you believe that it's the right approach is to the level of the regions. But there is the alternative to look at the whole brain using modern technology. And I will try to to address this question, not to, in any case, try to uh, to provide a unique answer, but the, the question that motivates this study is how is the relationship between structure and function modulated by general anesthesia in macaque and humans? And the data I'm going to present is it's data of of uh, Bechir Haraya and Lin Urik at the Neurospin. They perform fMRI uh, data acquisition in macaques in different, using different anesthetics, sevofloran, propofol, and ketamine in the anesthetic uh, doses. So, but I'm, I'm going to focus here only in propofol. Uh, so this is um, a video of, of Jacobo Cid that he used. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to work. 
because uh, it's it's just a PDF. But th this, uh, I hope you 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 have seen this video before, but shows that the functional connectivity is really dynamic. So it's it's it really changes in time. So it's not a good idea to consider that this is a fixed object that you compare with a fixed connectome. This is really something that changes during the time of the acquisition of data. So it's it's important to to take that into account account so the classical procedure to to evaluate the dynamical uh, aspects of the of different scans in different conditions is to concatenate the data so you put them in uh, in the same in, in a comparable setting so we use the set scores here and then a classical approach has been to use sliding windows and then trying to classify this um, cluster, this functional connectivity matrix that you have in short intervals of time using k-means. <clears throat> and this is a study of 2015, a PNAS work that if you find these seven centroids using the k-means and you order them in relation to the to the correlation with the structural connectivity matrix, so the connectome, two very nice things happen. The first is that you see a reduced repertoire in the, in the dynamical uh, visits in the states of, of, you go from awake that you visit all the states to uh, moderate sedation and deep sedation with propofol where you lose these two states. And the, the two states that you miss are those who are less similar to the connectome. And the states that you visit most are those in the, in the sedation condition are those that are more similar to the connectome. In a way, telling you that the correlations in the anesthetized, and the, in the anesthetized states are dictated by the physical connectivity, so the, the, the cables, if you want, of the brain. And similarly, again, uh, data of, of the lab of, of each year. This is deep brain simulation in, in central thalamus and ventrolateral thalamus and two different monkeys. And it's a very nice setup. So uh, the monkey are the monkeys are awake and you can evaluate how awake they are using this this um these different ways to evaluate the, the state of arousal. And then you anesthetize the monkeys using propofol. And then using the DBS, the deep brain stimulation in, this, in the central thalamus with low intensity, you see some signatures of awakening. But then if you go to, to, to a high a stimulation, so five volt uh, central thalamus, you awake the animal just using DBS. So the 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 animal is with uh, propofol, but it 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 shows some some uh, signatures of of arousal. And then if if you miss the target, so if you put uh, uh, if you put the elect, the um, the deep brain stimulations in the ventral thalamus. So you, you switch on the electrodes of the ventral thalamus, almost nothing happens. So nothing happens at, at, the, at the arousal level it, with low and high intensity. So in this study, they have uh, assessed different ways to evaluate uh, the, the different uh, conscious access, thalamus, thalamocortical interactions, and also the richness of the functional uh, repertoire. And this is more or less what they have found. If you focus here in the slopes, you see that the slope of the awake with uh, are it's it's low compared to anesthesia. It's more or less if you try to do a, a linear regression here, you see that here you have a kind of very slow slope and then high, and then it's it's uh, low again. But then with the ventrolateral, you see awake anesthesia, and in a way, the animal does not awake. So these two are very similar.
And one of the critiques of this method is that there's not a canonical way to choose the length of the time window. And then it's a clearly a tra trade-off in the sense that if the window is too small, you don't capture the correlations, but you have more data. But if the, if the, if the time windows are, are larger, you have less data. So there is an alternative that has been developed in the last years that is taking the that is to take the Hilbert transform of the ball signals and to extract the phase and this can be done by each TR so you don't have to choose any time window you can do that for every acquisition that you have from of your data and then you you will have a kind of arrow in each ROI and then you can compute the cosinus of the difference of the angles or the phases again for each TR. And then uh, this is a, a symmetric matrix. You can take just triangular superior, transform it into a vector, and then concatenate all the vectors of all the TRs of all the patients in all the conditions and try to apply the k-means algorithm. This is exactly the technique that has been used in this article of Athena de Mercy and collaborators that had been published a couple of years ago, where they found that using the same technique, you see this difference in the slopes that are, uh, this is healthy control, this is minimally conscious states, and this is unresponsive wellfulness states. This is a very nice article in which they collect uh, data from patients in Paris, Liège, and New York, and you see that there are centroids that really differentiate the different states of, of consciousness in this coma patient. So we are trying to apply the same technique, but now for the data of macaques, uh, propofol, and we have found exactly the same thing. So first of all, it's a reduced repertoire. So you go from seven state just to, to five states, and you see that slopes reflects very well the, the, the differences in the state of, of consciousness. So here it's awake, which is more almost a flat, a flat, uh, slope, and then moderate, uh, Propofol, which we know it's it's even it's it's not that different to 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 deep level of 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 propofol, um, and the, the the slope changes a lot, and you can do that the same for DBS data, so DBS uh, in the central thalamus, and we see that uh, when the the animal is awake, we see a kind of uh, a slow slope and then the animal uh, it's under propofol so it's unconscious and you see that the the state that you visit most is the number seven which is the closest to the connectum so the correlations in a way here though the coherence here is really dictated by the anatomical connectivity and then you lose this 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 prevalence of the of the last state when you awake the animal where the slope again uh, flatten again but if you do that with with uh, with the data of ventrolateral uh, ventrolateral uh, simulation you don't lose this high slope in a way the number seven and number six if you want are are the states that you visit the most so it's 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 a nice corroboration in a way of previous results using a more modern technique. But you can do the same with the data of humans, humans propofol. Here we have uh, the parcellation of Sheffer of 200 um, parcellations, so 200 ROIs. And then we observe more or less the same patterns here. Uh, in both cases, the number seven is the one that you visit the most, but here is clearly more present in the state of, of deep proper. For here, there are three states. It's the awake, deep prop fall, and recovery. And if you look at these two, they are very similar because this is awake, T propofol and recovery. And if you compare the slopes, it's we recover again the same type of results. 
but so far I haven't talked about uh, interspecies prefrontal cortex, and it, this is really a work under progress because I, uh, just a couple of weeks ago I more or less realized what we can do in this front. So I have selected their ROIs uh, belonging to the prefrontal cortex in the Cocomac uh, parcellation, and then if you call in something that we focus on we are focusing on it's in the in the pattern number one and the pattern number seven that we know that change between conditions so again pattern number one is more visit in the awake states and the pattern number seven are the the one that are more visit in the unconscious states in all the different experiments that i've shown so something that i have done here but i haven't done yet the statistical analysis is to take the positive coherence between these two these two um, centroids but you can take also the anti-coherence so the most negative ones and then again something that i haven't done is the is to see the trajectories of the different of the different uh focused um, structure function correlation. So something we can do is to take the first row of this centroid, which is more or less the coherence of the region number one in the centroid number one, and compare with the anatomical connectivity of each region. And you can do that for all the regions of all the centroids and see this increasing tendency for all the regions. So we can do the same for this for the thalamus, for the DBS in the central thalamus, and you you observe differences in the coherence of the different patterns. So again, I think an, a nice uh, statistical analysis is here still to be done, but I think we will have nice differences in the activity of the coherence of the central thalamus in the in uh, the coherence of the of the brain in the in the state of of awakening due to dbs stimulation of the central thalamus under anesthesia and you can do the same for all the rest of the of the data so i'm not i'm going to skip this so just to finish uh, next steps are are more focused on what this this talk should have been. It's mainly focused on the modeling. So we have a a, a way to model the whole brain of the macaque at different scales and using different monitors, using eBrains. One of the monitors are bold signals and we have data of monkeys and humans anesthetized with propofol and with other um, agents. And we know how the brain behaves at different scales under anesthesia. So it would be really nice to add some mechanistic hypothesis to see how if we can recover in simulations the activity of the brain under anesthesia so again this is a, 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 a an ongoing work that uh, we believe that will be complete uh, soon and i was just talking to shan shan froles and i think something that we really need are the pet scans of the gaba a receptors in the macaque brain because that would be a really interesting mechanistic hypothesis also to see if neuromodulating the gaba a in the models can recover the statistical properties that we observe of the macaque brain under propofol and it's more or less the same idea that had been used before in the lab of Gustavo Deco to try to model the, LS, the, the, the effects of the LSD in the brain using the 5-HT2A receptors modulation in the model. And the same thing here by Gustavo Lupian collaborators using the GBA air receptors, but in humans. Again, these are whole brain models, and we believe that we can observe a similar uh, behavior in the for the for the data of of Bashir. Another thing that I could uh, that I would like to do in the future is to try to model uh, recent uh, results in the lab of Fanis and Neurospin. They have implanted a, a, a multi electrode array from the PFC, and this multi electrode array can be uh, you can stimulate one of the electrodes and see 
how is the propagation of the stimulus as a function of this of the state of consciousness let's say of of the of the macaque so the macaque is in different levels and the different levels of anesthesia and the spread of the of of the stimulus is different in these three states as it's uh, it's a, it's a really recent data, but we think that we have developed in the lab of Alan a mean field model, a two-dimensional mean field model with excitatory and inhibitory connections. And we believe that we will feed this data and try to propose some mechanistic hypothesis about why these things are, the, the spread of the, of the stimulus is, is different in both cases. Again, I mean, this technique is far, it's far reaching. So we have also, we are also analyzing human sleeps and it will be really nice if you have data of macaques in different states of, of, of sleep just to compare and to see what is the role of prefrontal cortex here. And I, I think I, I don't have more time, but just to mention that we are also exploring different ways to analyze the structure function correlation between a structure function interdependency in the macaque brain in anesthesia. So there is a canonical way to, to compute this uh, connectome harmonics that is based on the connectome of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian that you can compute from the connectome. And we have, again, not more time, but we have found very nice results that kind of corroborate a previous result that have been found in anesthesia in, in humans. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And these are the collaborators that I've been working with. Thank you.